Here is part 2 of the Vampire of Krakow. If you haven't watched the first episode please do so then return to this video. Kat found his next victim, 11-year-old Lesek Kalnik, near Kosciusko Mound, where a toboggan contest for children was being held on February 13, 1966. In an act of overkill, the young child was struck down in a frenzied assault, with experts stating at the trial that the wounds inflicted on the corpse of the small boy had far exceeded those necessary to cause death. Once again, terror returned to the city as people feared the vampire of Krakow had returned. Some residents began sleeping with wooden boards beneath their shirts to protect against knife wounds. In claiming his second victim, Kot was ecstatic and enjoying his criminal success. When the newspapers published a photograph of the young boy killed by the vampire of Krakow, he was so happy that he ran to his older friend from the sports club, Danuta W., and boasted that it was his work, announcing that he would make it his bedroom wallpaper. But those closest to him never took him seriously, and his parents never suspected their son could be a killer. Cot later said he gained a sort of perverse and secret thrill from sitting at the family dinner table, by his own admission as the unremarkable boy that he was, while his father snorted in derision and commented that, only a bastard could commit such heinous acts it was Denuda whom he would confide in the most. And while later that he pitted the most, he referred to her as his girlfriend. He confessed to her his lust for blood, and once even held a knife to her throat to see the insane fear in her eyes, something Denuda dismissed as a tasteless joke. But when he revealed to her that he had shards of glass in his pockets, with which he planned to cut her with and then plan on her body in order to make it look like suicide, did she become concerned. Denuda convinced him to go see a doctor, who merely sent him home with some vitamins. Yet Denuda did not go to the police and report her friend, refusing to take his sadistic tendencies seriously and believing that Cot was just a harmless or troubled young man. But she was soon to change her mind. Two months later, on April 14, 1966, Cot was sitting on some steps outside of an apartment building on Jana the 3rd Sobieskigo Street, waiting for his next victim, when a seven-year-old girl, called Malgosia, came downstairs to collect letters from the mailbox. Cot grabbed her and dealt eight stab wounds to the stomach, chest and back. However, people passing by came to her rescue and she survived. The young girl could remember little about her attacker, except that he was wearing a white scarf. After the attack Cot went to a police station to extend his gun license and then returned home to eat dinner. Four days later, Cot returned to the scene of the crime, inquiring about the victim's name from her mother. After several attacks, the police were now under enormous pressure to find the culprit, and detectives extended their investigation, increasing the number of police patrols in Krakow, while officers were instructed to pay specific attention to any young men behaving abnormally. Investigators working the case discovered similarities between the attacks. Based on surviving victim testimony, it was believed that the killer always acted alone, chose victims weaker than himself, and attacked quickly, inflicting blows to the abdomen and upper back. In addition, police didn't believe the motive for the attacks to be robbery as the perpetrator never spoke with the victims and no items were ever taken from the victims. Despite the fact that investigators were aware that the attacker was a young man, they still could not find their suspect. A report from a taxi driver, who had accurately described Kot, was given to police. However, authorities from the Communist Polish People's Republic deemed it unreliable, given that was provided by a representative of the so-called private initiative, who they claimed could not count it on as a credible. As news of this latest victim spread throughout the city, Kot's friend, Danuta W., now began to suspect that he really was the vampire of Krakow. She hesitated for some time, believing he was innocent, however, his accounts of the attacks were so detailed that she believed it could not be the product of a sick imagination, and decided to report her suspicions to the police. Shortly after he graduated from school, Cot was arrested on June 1, 1966. Officers who arrived at Cot's apartment were astonished when they met at the door by kind and polite young man. Given that so much time had elapsed between the last attack and his capture, there is a theory that the police deliberately delayed the arrest until after his final exams. The fact that Cot passed his exams, it could be used in court to prove his sanity and mental capacity had not been diminished when carrying out his crimes. 
After intensive questioning, Cott was charged with two counts of murder, ten attempted murders, and four instances of arson. Initially, Cott denied everything, but when confronted with his suspected victims, he confessed to everything and began proudly talking about his achievements. When in the presence of one of his surviving victims who recognized him, Cott said, Your memory is good, come here so I can finish you off. He reenacted some of the crimes before investigators, showing them how he held his knife and the way in which he approached his victims, all the while grinning for the camera as he held a knife to a young woman assisting with the investigation. In custody, he underwent a variety of psychological tests in order to better understand his state of mind, and numerous expert witnesses were appointed to discover the cause of Cott's psychopathic behavior. They learned that Cott had shown strange inclinations since his early childhood, along with a morbid interest in death. After a series of psychological observations and examinations, the doctors were unanimous in their diagnosis that he was completely sane and could stand trial and face the full consequences of his actions. When asked in an interview whether he was aware of the notion of murder being a crime and an evil deed, Cod explained his moral standards. Evil men, he said, were drunkards and those who consorted with prostitutes. According to Cot, what determines moral appropriateness of human actions is the fact that they bring an individual satisfaction and a sense of fulfilled duty. In his eyes, he was only a murderer and not inherently evil. As he explained, suffering is beauty, and inflicting pain and suffering on someone is a work of art, adding not everyone can do it. He even went so far as to suggest that he might be set free, in order to remove undesirable people as a service to society. During his time in custody, as he pondered his fate, Cot said the pleasure I felt when a knife was cleaving the meant, it's impossible to describe the feeling. The experience is worth the gallows. Arraigned before the court on May 3, 1967, Cott gave a very detailed testimony of his crimes before the court, along with his plans that he had not yet managed to carry out. These plans that he revealed were so extreme that the court had them withheld. Throughout the proceedings, Cott did not display any sign of contrition or remorse. On the contrary, he was relaxed and seemed unaware of the possible sentence he could receive. The trial aroused great interest amongst the public, who demanded he receive the death penalty. The most contentious issue presented at the trial was the assessment of his mental state at the time of the murders. Two teams of experts were consulted on the matter, whose opinions of Cott's sanity differed. Forensic experts from Krakow found Cott to be the classic example of a psychopath, with a deviation from the norms of temperament, drive and character, coupled with a lack of higher emotionality. They presented to the court that Cott was a limited sanity murderer who could not adapt to social norms. Meanwhile, psychiatrists believed that Cott was aware of the harmful effects of his actions, and was, to some degree, even able to control them. The fact he was able to refrain from attacking under certain circumstances, further supported their theory of Cott's overall sanity. During visits to the crime scenes, and during the court hearings, Cott smiled, and looked like good-natured boy. When weapons or detailed descriptions of his crimes were presented to the court, he visibly smiled and appeared happy. Consequently, the court upheld the opinion of the psychiatric experts, and on July 14, 1967, they found Cott guilty of murder, condemning him to death. Because of this verdict, he lost his citizen rights. As Cott was only sentenced for the murder of 11-year-old Lesek Kalak, his lawyers filed an appeal to the Supreme Court on November 22, 1967, based on diminished responsibility. The court took into consideration the testimony of the forensic experts along with Cott's young age and overturned the death penalty ruling and instead sentenced Cott to life imprisonment. The general prosecutor of the Polish People's Republic, however, had the right to revise the sentence and on March 11, 1968, reconvened the Supreme Court. Once again Cott was sentenced to death by hanging. The judgment of the Supreme Court was based on the callous murder of the 11-year-old boy in Cott's attempt to kill the 7-year-old girl, stating, taking into account, the defenseless beings, his cynicism and lack of remorse, the only right punishment is the death penalty. The sentence was carried out on May 16, 1968, and Carol Cott, the vampire of Krakow, was executed by hanging. 
Some sources describe how after the execution, an autopsy of Carol Cott showed that he had been suffering from a previously undiagnosed large brain tumor. However, author Pershemisla Semksuk disputes this fact in his book. According to the author, autopsies were not carried out on convicts sentenced to death. Moreover, no official documents are known to exist that confirm an autopsy was carried out on Carol Cott. The legend of the vampire of Krakow endures, and today he exists as a minor celebrity in Poland, and although the elder residents once lived in fear of a vampiric creature of the night, it is the younger generation who have become enthralled with fascination by his misdeeds. For customers over the age of 18, one can enjoy the macabre Krakow, a free walking tour of the crime scenes associated with Kot. Those with a thirst for more than just true crime can enjoy an arsenic-free beer for 5ZL on the Rhineck at the Cockerola pub, where the mascot and a grinning cat perched next to an effigy of Edgar Allan Poe. Despite this renewed interest for Kot, the pain and suffering he caused can never be forgotten, and much like the Nazis he so admired, Carol Kot should be remembered as a warning from history. Thanks for watching part 2 of the Vampire of Krakow. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you'll know when we post new videos. Click one of the videos below to continue watching.